Hello. Good morning. Okay, we're going to do what we did yesterday. Who had a good time yesterday? <laughs> Who had a bad time yesterday? All right, that's good. Um, I want everyone to close their eyes, please. Put down their phones. Both feet on the ground. Get grounded. Back for day two or three, if you remember. Uh, and we're going to do three breaths. We're going to do three seconds in, seven seconds out, and those seven seconds, I just want to hear it, like spit on the person in front of you. Okay, ready? In and out. And in and out. Last one. And really push it out. In and out. I'm Greg. I run things here with the team. I just want to thank the incredible team, the staff, everyone from yesterday, and for everyone playing their part. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to our programming director, Katie, to introduce what will arguably be one of the most banger talks of the weekend. Yeah, I think uh, our first guest of the day needs a little introduction to the people who are here. Thank you for coming early and you're welcome. We pushed the talk by 15 minutes because I know you are, we're all still sleeping. Um, Toby Shorin was the first talk of the first fest ever. And I think the way that talk radiated out into the world, life after lifestyle, uh, we're, we're still seeing the effects today. So Toby, you have big shoes to fill, your own. <laughs> Take it away. You have a microphone. Yeah. You also have a cooler microphone than me. So. Thanks. Is it on? I can't. I can't really tell. All right. Great. All right, everyone. <laughs> Sit down. Sit down. Listen closely, and take a minute to settle in, beginning by imagining a plane of light at the top of your head. Now sense as it passes its way down the tip of your scalp, your forehead. Notice it rolling over the bridge of your nose. Now slowly visualizing this plane of light making its way past your throat. Are you making subtle movements there? Down to your shoulders, shoulders and arms. Aware of the breathing in your chest. Your chest fills and releases with air. Noticing your diaphragm now. Scanning your whole body down further. Slowly, slowly now. Feeling the weight of your body on the chair. The points of contact between the clothes of your, and your skin. Your feet. The heft of glass and screen in your hand. Can you feel it? Can you notice the heat or cold of the air around you? And can you sense the newfound fascination with the body that permeates the airspace. The spirit of Boccioni is alive and well in America. After all, it was an American industry, an American elites, American cities, American modernity, and the American century which inspired Italian futurists to refashion the classic image of man as dynamic, fluid, mechanical, technological. Now we Americans are at it again. Ancestral diets, crip cultures, diagnostic identities, health protocols, entrepreneurial interest in biomedicine, surrogacy, ubiquitous biometric measurement and trauma discourse are all facets of the body's increasing role in social thought. The new body futurism takes over from the now tired futurism of software, but it's made of the same raw materials mined from the California coast. Body futurism is the result of a republic turning its mind inward, opponents of Cartesianism seizing the day, uh, technologists moving their attention from virtual spaces to physical places. In other words, body futurism is overdetermined, so best get familiar. Settle in, settle in. For nearly 20 years, software and hardware technology have been the platform for utopian fantasies in the West. The cypherpunk and crypto-anarchist movements laid out visions of digital nations without states, anonymous peer-to-peer -peer exchange, and free information flow, all based on cryptography. Social media was hailed as a technology that would enable the spread of open societies. The wave of crypto-utopianism, beginning in 2016, injected new life into these narratives, adding new ideas around global coordination, private money, and a world computer that would disintermediate legacy institutions. 
More recently, network states, which start as online communities and later materialize into the physical realm, have captured the imagination, recapitulating the liberal vision in a collision of silicon and carbon. These are the big cases, but there have been many of small ones. The sharing economy, the gig economy, the ownership economy, the economy economy. In each, some specific piece of technology is inflated by the venture asset class, asking, what can this technology do into a social utopian vision? The physical body was almost entirely absent in these utopian ideas. Whether it's ignoring the role of violence in maintaining the state, or it's memeing things into the discourse as a world-building strategy, the body played little role in the utopian thought of the 2010s. Thanks to Twitter, every piece of technology became a disembodied space of thought. The AI space, the crypto space, the cloud space. Software was the dominant mode, and everyone thought the medium was the message. But sometime in the last two years, this began to change. Software has eaten the world, and there is little left to consume. It has not delivered on its utopian premises, leaving us radicalized, black-pilled, and doomer. Only the promise of an AI god holds out hope for software futurists. Moreover, tech positivism is in the process of transmuting itself into a variety of other domains. You no longer need to work in tech to hold the cultural positions of tech workers. Now there are life scientists, housing lobbyists, and energy policy advocates who all hold textile builderist stances. Climate thinking is moving away from limiting consumption, degrowth, to energy abundance. And the transition from harm reduction to longevity is an identical move in biomedicine. Yes, tech cultural hegemony is now an inevitability, but very few grasp the most vital point of this moment. With the fall of software comes the return of the repressed, the body itself. The body is replacing technology as the site of utopian imaginaries. Longevity, immortality, consciousness hacking, advanced meditative states, direct gnosis, enhanced Olympics, and super intelligent designer babies are the new super meme complexes. Each one of these makes the body itself the platform for some kind of social vision. For Brian Johnson's Don't Die movement, the idea is to compete with AI by building a religion based on surviving into an ever-extending horizon. For Buddhist-pilled AI alignment researchers, the idea is a world of super-compassionate meditators operationalizing stream entry and evangelizing meta-practice. For gene editors, it's a world of genius baby gronks quoting James Joyce and coding up their first company. Unlike the disembodied ideologies of social media world building, these imaginaries have a directly embodied quality. With the rise of these embodied ideologies and networked faiths, one might say that the 70s are coming back. But what's really happening is the human potential movement out of Esalen all those years ago is finally fruiting into its full form. The human potential movement took California frontierism and applied it to the human body itself. The human potential movement was an evolutionary mysticism. It wanted to leverage what was until now dormant in man, accessed only through mystical experience. It was obsessed with the idea that we use only 10% of the neurons in our brain, with psychical research, with mind-opening drugs, with peak experiences. The goal of human potential is to create the superhuman. And we now hear echoes of the same superhumanism in today's body futurist movements through, although technologies that augment our, cap our capacities play a larger role. Thus, we have ultrasound headband to induce lucid dreams and unlock unheard of qualia. We have ultra rigorous diet protocols to maximize our mitochondrial production and infinite life and artificially intelligent meditation instructions to create a society of sages. Everything happening now is downstream of Esalen in some way, from mixed modality social sauna spaces to alternative worship in converted Christian churches in Berlin to the explosive popularity of somatic therapies. Mind-body practitioners of all types, from rolfers to Lomi methodologists to holotropic breath workers to qigongers and tantricas, traveled out of Esalen and settled the West, becoming a kind of alternative American folk religion from Boulder to, to Asheville. Now, after years of quiet incubation, these body practices are entering the mainstream. 
or mainstream America is finally coming back to its folk roots. Builders have become bodybuilders. Peptides and gene therapies have replaced Soylent. The muscle tea and chain has replaced Zuck's famous hoodie. And the office cold plunge has replaced the office beanbag couch. And this is just among the elite segment. Embodied practices from trauma release to somatic experiencing are squarely in the Overton window. And more and more yoga studios are turning into alternative healing clinics. Now, two years ago, I told you on this very stage that we're entering life after lifestyle. I declared the end of the brand and the rise of religion. I said we're going from direct-to-consumer brands to direct-to-consumer practices. Well, now everything is some kind of run club, surf club, lifting club, walking club, hiking club, chess club, sauna club. I hope you're happy. Also, hope you're paying attention. This is why it's incorrect to assume, as many do, that the popularization of mental health discourse is merely uh, attributed to COVID years, and it's not merely a pendulum swing against disembodied software either. The new body futurism is much more than a trend in the marketplace of ideas. It's the moral source of what is fashionable now, even when the fashions themselves are competing. Ray Peatheads going on an ice cream and carrot salad diet and paleo warriors pushing steak and eggs are both capable of earnest moral posturing. That is the point. Anything that captures the imagination today, whether scientific or spiritual, unfailingly draws from the realm of embodied practice. The network ideologies that matter now are the ones that promote diets, mindfulness and prayer practices, biometric monitoring systems, and health protocols. Now, Twitter is where the intelligentsia converse about body practices, but TikTok is the natural battlefield where they're disseminated. What Twitter did for social discourse, proliferate 100,000 bizarre micro-ideologies and rhetorically enhance strains of argumentation, like germs becoming resistance to antibiotics of institutional authority, TikTok is doing for the social body. Twitter is the public space, the noosphere, the marketplace of ideas. TikTok is the corpus publica, the somosphere, the body politic. On TikTok, people aren't just doing therapy. They're breathing, they're tapping, they're stretching to release trauma. And now the 1910 Flexner Report excised mind cures and homeopathy from medical practice, and now they're back with a vengeance. They're psyching themselves into thinking they have Tourette's and then curing themselves. Every media, every media takes some kind of human faculty and extends it into the public domain. It is the TikTok media format that has turned these body practices into remixable content. Anything and everything can become a trend on TikTok. A TikTok trend is a social algorithm that can be adopted by others. In other words, a protocol. And TikTokers cycle between body practices and identification protocols just like fashion. Now, it may be over for brands, but body practices are no less competitive. Body futurism implies a war over the literal movements of muscles, the data of cardiovascular systems, and even the content of dreams. It's just like competition between open source projects. Health protocols are open source software you can find on a GitHub repo. Supplements and instructors commercialize and help you implement them. The protocol is, so far, the native social form of body futurism. It is the embodied version of the e-ideology, composed of a charismatic influencer, a social media mind virus, and a fruiting body, a type of guy. The moral is literally embedded into the muscle fiber of society. Now, the protocol is notably different than a regimen. A regimen is a mere plan, idiosyncratic to individuals. If you follow Schwarzenegger's workout regimen, that's simply to imitate the man himself. But to follow a protocol is to participate in a new kind of social architecture. A protocol specifies a scope of action within which you are a participant. A protocol purports to be consentful and participatory. And indeed, protocols have the potential to create new forms of radical social practice. But like all consentful systems, network effects may still emerge, which are in effect coercive. You have heard of protocols, but you need to understand protocolism. 
the type of social control native to a world enchanted by protocols. As Deleuze says in his famous postscript on societies of control, we've torn down the disciplinary societies of enclosed interiors, the prison, the hospital, the factory, the school, the family, and replaced it with a control society based on free movement, free love, free payment, freedom of religion. But this society is still indebted, overworked, data mined, and all this is self-chosen. Protocolism fulfills communism via the completion of self-monitoring and self-censorship. No protocolism. New understandings of the personal body always lead to new ideas of the social body, and vice versa. The medieval body politic was based on an anatomy of limbs. The head, the torso, and the feet symbolically justified the social hierarchy of kings, nobles, and peasantry. The public sphere of the 19th and 20th century is almost entirely constructed on the metaphor of a literate, reading, debating body of people. All of the verbs for public agency are verbs for private reading, transposed upward to the aggregate of readers. Readers may scrutinize, ask, reject, opine, decide, judge, and so on. Publics can do exactly these things and nothing else. But today's embodied sciences, protocols, and movements foreshadow different kinds of political thinking. Brian Johnson's body monitoring blueprint protocol is explicitly a vision for how the Earth should be monitored, measured, and governed. Continuous hormone tracking and the discovery of male hormonal cycles may give rise to different distributions of social roles between men and women. And research on the gut-brain axis, consciousness, and the nervous system will undoubtedly have an extraordinary effect on political imagery in due time. But such developments are utterly nascent at this moment. The political dimension of this embodied turn is most apparent for now in the cultural taste for the pathological. Body futurism is visible in the ideas of a society convinced of its own sickness. The techno-pessimism, gerontocratic institutional mistrust, and senile nostalgic mongering of the 2010s fostered a general sense of dis-ease. Now that very same resentment has found a home in various embodied maladies. The loneliness epidemic, the toxic food system, hormonal dysregulation, microplastics, the neurotic obsession with declining sperm counts, declining sex rates, declining everything. If the American empire is in decline, then the body politic itself must be sick. That's what the logic seems to be. Granola crunchers and anti-vaxxers, VIP public servants and mental health researchers, quantified self-trackers, looks-maxing teens, and all quadrants of the political alignment have their own talking points about the maladies of the social body. Now, of course, decline is not just a metaphorical matter. With the recent Biden-Trump debate, there's been a palpable shift uh, from political hope to inward-looking cope in America. The decline of software-based ideology has also meant the decline of the disembodied ideal of software-based political praxis. Social media politics took two forms. One is social media-based memetics, language-based activism and cancel culture. The other is utopian what-if thinking and uh, institutional world building. Both are totally detached from the reality of on-the-ground movement building and political reform, and both have become impossible now. Memeing things into the discourse, or Pepe or Milady-style meme activism, is politically impotent. So is grand narrative uh, idea machine world building like progress studies. They no longer seem possible now that Twitter has turned into Elon's personal propaganda machine. New institutions never arose. Now the historian Oswald Spengler distinguishes between an early culture and its late civilization stage. A culture in its declining autumn days becomes like ours. Rational, rigid, megalopolitan, bureaucratized, petrified, managerial, despiritualized, refined, ornamental, and wedded to the politics of progress. If our political institutions have failed, and so have ineffectual social media memeplexes, we obviously need a different kind of politics. That is the deeper point of body futurism, of all this somatic experiencing. It's a return to the body as the basic political unit. This is not 
neoliberal atomization, but a literal decomposition of our tired political bodies, our geriatric institutional bodies, and our abstracted social media bodies, a decomposition of those bodies into firm, energetic, sensual, individual bodies. Bodies are the foundation of what is real and of relationships to one another. If institutions can no longer be relied on, we can only place hope in local forms of sufficiency based on mutual relations between bodies. For Spengler, culture is embedded in deep-seated institutions about number, senses of space and time, in destiny. These intuitions work themselves out in local vernaculars, art, architecture, music, and mathematics. The awakening of a new culture out of a proto-spirituality, he says, is a young and trembling soul, heavy with misgivings, that is expressed in the art forms of a newborn culture. These intuitions on which these local vernaculars are based inevitably are derived from different kinds of body sensations. Body up experimentation. Bodies moving in space, sensing each other, touching, exploring from first principles. What is actually good for the body? What kinds of social forms heal me, repair me? This is quite a different use of the body than big scale body futures or homogenizing protocols. It's more of a local or folk vernacular. The mysticism and eroticism of the somatic in all its varieties and forms. Instead of protocols producing people, it's about people creating themselves. I believe that this is what is happening now, an enlightenment of the body. But for this enlightenment to be fully realized, this decomposition of social bodies into individual bodies must continue. In an era of institutional decline and distrust, what could be more natural than bodily autonomy? It is the phenomenological experience of institutions as defective, domineering, and extractive that drives one back to what one can control. A new politics based on the possibilities of the body is inevitable. As Spinoza said, we do not even know what a body can do. Spinoza is the philosopher for this moment. His ethics are entirely based on the body. He says, when a body encounters another body, or an idea another idea, it happens that the two relations combine to form a more powerful whole. And sometimes one decomposes the other, destroying the cohesion of its parts. We experience joy when a body encounters ours and enters into composition with it, and sadness when, on the contrary, a body or an idea threatens our own coherence. The good is when a body directly compounds its relation with ours and with all of its or part of its power increases ours. A food, for example. For us, the bad is when a body decomposes our body's relation, although it still combines with our parts, but in ways that do not correspond to our essence, as when a poison breaks down the blood. The relevance of Spinoza now is that when we return to bodies, when we return to mere sensation, it's possible to find what brings us joy, what compounds our power and assists us in becoming more free. Freedom, power, joy, these may be found in solitude, but man does not live alone. As Hannah Arendt says, no man can be sovereign because not one man but men inhabit the earth. And it is only from the collision of bodies in space in the attempts to create new bodily arrangements that we can find new social forms, new architectures, new local vernaculars that form the foundation of a new culture. This is a shift in how we think about selfhood. Now we are used to thinking of digital media as the primary way personhood is produced types of guys, digitally promulgated protocols, e-ideologies. 
But this suggests we think of bodily intake, bodily practices, and bodily relations as the media that realize a self. So you, you and your body, the very thighs you're sitting on, the very lungs you're breathing with, the very hand you're gripping with, you and your body are the material, the resource at stake in this body futurism. Rather than making ideological questions into proxy battlefields for our embodied relational desires, we must learn to build community out of our experience. Mutual relation between bodies based on joyous affect is the underlying principle of body futurism. In order to do this, we have to sensitize ourselves to joyous affect. We have to avoid the sad passions, hatred, and remorse. We have to avoid poisonous disintermediation of our relations with one another via protocols or otherwise. To enlighten the body is to immerse ourselves in practices that sensitize our physical perception to these relations. Whether focusing or somatic experiencing or contact improv or sound bathing or hot or cold exposure, not as self-care or vague wellness, but contact with our experience. It would be wrong to construe this as navel gazing. Spinoza saw joyous relations between bodies as the foundation of the good. Christ taught universal love between men. It's only in a society based on harmonious relations between and among people and from the working out of harmonious body politics into more elaborate forms that new social bodies can grow. That is why to be a futurist you have to become a body first and foremost. You must become intimately aware, intimately aware of the most basic phenomenological sensations. You have to know what is the sense I get from the air around me right now? What is it like to be near whoever I am sitting next to? Can I feel their presence right now? What is my experience of this space, this architecture, this social scene? Was this interaction successful or unsuccessful? Does it make me feel nourished, enriched, or do I feel blocked, stupefied, threatened, or dominated in some way? And what role did I have in how this interaction played out? Did I carry myself at arm's length? With distance? With rejection? Or with openness? With a yes in my heart? With love? Spengler wrote The Decline of the West. But I say America is not the West, but something new. The decomposition of our institutions into mere body acts and back again is the natural cycle of cultural death and rebirth. It's time to let the old die. The corpse of an imminent God is the placenta of our new cosmology. There is nothing more important to the renewal of culture than the enlightenment of the body itself. The cultivation of deep phenomenological insight is the foundation of a new idea of what life can be. This idea is very, very nascent. But if you sit here, listen closely, settle in, Feel your forehead, the bridge of your nose, your breathing chest. If you listen to your heart as it beats to you, if you hear what it whispers when you sit, when you stand, when you leave this place, 
when you meet another's gaze, you can feel it as through the gauze of a veil.